Many of you have asked about the fasting mimicking diet. So today we're going to take a look at some of the science behind it. So the fasting mimicking diet is a dietary pattern developed by Professor Walter Longo and his team at USC, University of Southern California. And as the name indicates, fasting mimicking diet, the idea is to imitate fasting, is to get the benefits of fasting without actually having to fast. So it's a very low calorie, low protein, high fat diet. And just like fasting, it's not something that you do continuously. It's done in bursts. And specifically, each cycle is five days long. The first day of the fasting mimicking diet is kind of a transition. You get about 50 to 60% of your normal calories. So this is about 1,100 calories, give or take. Depends a bit on the individual. And most of those calories come from fat, up to 90%. And it's mostly unsaturated fats from nuts and seeds, olive oil, algae oil, they're all plant fats, so the fasting mimicking diet is entirely plant-centered. And it's a commercial product. It's sold by a company. It comes in these prepackaged kits. I have no affiliation with them. As regular viewers already know, we have no connection with any commercial product. After that first day, it gets more intense. Days two through five, you get 35 to 40 percent of normal calories per day. So that adds up to about seven to eight hundred calories daily, and 40 percent of those come from fat. So carbs make up from 10% to 50% of calories, depending a bit on the day. And protein is anywhere from 11% down to single digits. So it's pretty low protein. These kits include foods like vegetable soups, energy bars with nuts. The snacks are things like olives and kale crackers. There's a number of herbal teas. There's a proprietary drink with glycerol. And the idea, they say, is to preserve muscles during the fast. And then there's a supplement with some vitamins, some minerals, some amino acids, and some omega-3s. They've tested this diet, and it affects some of the same biomarkers as water fasting. So things like glucose levels, ketone bodies, so it's a ketogenic diet, and also IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. They've tested the fasting mimicking diet in mice, in lab animals, and it showed a number of benefits. Reduction of visceral fat, improving bone mineral density, it improved cognitive function, it even reduced the risk of developing tumors and it extended mouse lifespan. Now, to the investigators' credit, they didn't stop there. They actually went on and ran human trials. So this is good for you guys to get used to seeing that progression. A mouse result doesn't mean we're done, doesn't mean we assume the same thing happens in humans. We actually test it. So in humans, the way they do it is they run the trial for a few months and the fasting mimicking diet is done in those five-day-long cycles, and there's one cycle per month. So each month, there's about 26 days of regular diet, and then five days of fasting mimicking diet. So for example, one trial that lasted three months, so that's three cycles of fasting mimicking diet, showed a reduction in body weight, body fat, blood pressure, insulin resistance, and hemoglobin A1c, so glycated hemoglobin. They also estimated biological age. So chronological age is just how long it's been since we were born. Biological age is an estimate of how aged we are. And it's calculated based on a number of these biomarkers, these biochemical parameters, things like hemoglobin A1c, C-reactive protein, so inflammatory markers, cholesterol, blood pressure, etc. And they estimate that the participants on the fasting mimicking diet had a lower biological age by the end of the experiment, by the end of the trial, which essentially means some of these parameters were improved. They also estimated life expectancy and mortality, and both of those seemed also improved in the participants on the fasting mimicking diet. Now, this is just an estimate. It's just a calculation. They didn't actually run the trial for years and years and measure uh, death and life expectancy. So some caveats there, but it's an interesting observation. Another interesting thing they looked at is whether this change in biological age, this improvement in biological age is explained by the weight loss. So anytime you take people and you put them on one of these trial diets, it's common to see improvement in a number of metabolic parameters in biomarkers. And one obvious question is whether the weight loss itself from the caloric restriction that most of these diets facilitate, if that alone explains the biomarker changes. And their analysis indicates that the weight loss alone and the BMI reduction alone don't seem to explain these changes in the biological parameters and in the biological age. So it's possible 
that there's something else there. It's an interesting observation as well. Now, all of these findings are interesting, but this is comparing individuals on the fasting mimicking diet to controls that didn't change anything. So they just kept on their regular diet. And these are U.S. participants, which typically don't have the healthiest diets in the world. So the question is, okay, putting somebody on the fasting mimicking diet might improve things a bit compared to their regular standard American diet. But how does it compare to another healthy dietary pattern? So they did run another trial that was published not too long ago where they compared head-to-head -head the fasting mimicking diet to a Mediterranean diet. So again, to the investigator's credit, they kept testing things higher and higher bars, and it's pretty bold to put it up against the Mediterranean diet, arguably the most documented and most validated dietary pattern that we have. So they took 80 participants, all overweight, and they randomly split them between the fasting mimicking diet group and the Mediterranean diet group, and then they followed them for four months. And again, the fasting mimicking diet is done one cycle a month. So five days a month, they're on it. The other 25, 26, they're on their regular diet. And the Mediterranean diet group switched full-time to a Mediterranean diet. Now, one common question that you guys have is duration. Why four months? Why not four years? Or why not 40 years? Uh, the obvious answer is, one, these trials cost a lot of money. Also, compliance is hard. The longer you draw out a trial, the harder it is to keep people compliant, and you end up losing a lot of participants to poor adherence. So it's not the most common to see very long data sets looking at diet. The Mediterranean diet is actually an exception. We do have fairly long data sets. Both randomized trials and cohort studies uh, lasting several years. So that's a luxury, but unfortunately, it's pretty hard to replicate. Another common question is regarding the volunteers. Why are they always overweight? Why are they always a bit sick before the trial, right? Number one, because it reflects a Western population. You could start with people who are super healthy, but then the results would be applicable to a tiny percentage of the Western population and U.S. populations specifically, unfortunately. Also, if you start with volunteers that are super healthy, that are 20-year-old Olympians, there's nothing to improve upon. They're super lean. All the blood markers are perfect. You're not going to see any change. Not over months, not even over years, unless you're making things worse. That said, this is a valid caveat for you. If your health is perfect, you are super lean and all your blood markers are perfect, you're just a stud all around, yeah, these trials are going to be less informative for you because you're not looking for a short-term improvement. You're looking to maintain your studness uh, over the long run, over decades, right? So that's where these longer data sets come in. Okay, so what happened in the trial? Both of the groups saw an improvement and there was no significant difference between them. So the improvements were roughly similar. Both saw a reduction in body weight, BMI, waist circumference, body fat, and total cholesterol, and similar extent in both groups. There were a couple parameters that were reduced in one diet but not the other over the course of the trial, but none of them were significantly different between the two diet groups by the end of the trial. So, for example, the fasting mimicking diet reduced IGF-1 and hemoglobin A1c over the course of the trial, so compared to baseline, the Mediterranean diet did not. On the other hand, the Mediterranean diet reduced insulin resistance, fasting glucose, and the prevalence of diabetes compared to baseline. The fasting mimicking diet did not. But in all of these cases, there was no significant difference between the two groups by the end of the trial. They also looked at a measure of endothelial function, and it was actually reduced on the fasting mimicking diet. No significant change on the Mediterranean diet. But again, between the two groups, no significant difference by the end of the trial. After that four-month intervention where the participants were split between the two diets, the investigators had another three-month period, essentially a maintenance period, where everybody, regardless of group, was told to go on a healthy dietary pattern, including fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, heart-healthy fats, and restricting processed foods, added sugar, and refined grains. So a pretty general health recommendation. And during this maintenance period, all of the participants essentially held on to the benefits. They kept the weight off and actually kept losing a little bit more. And again, by the end of these three months, the majority of the parameters were not significantly different between the two groups. One exception was the participants that had to come from the Mediterranean diet seemed to lose a little bit more fat-free mass and a bit more muscle mass 
during this three-month maintenance period. Hard to know exactly what that means because remember, they're not on the intervention diets anymore. They're not on the Mediterranean or the FMD diets anymore. And also during the actual intervention phase, while they were on the two assigned diets, there was no significant change to muscle mass. So it's a little unclear what this means, if it has anything to do with the diets they were on previously or not. They also assessed food intake during the intervention, during the four months, and there was no significant difference in most food types between the two groups. Obviously, this refers to the weeks where they are not on the fasting mimicking diet, so the 25 or 26 days where they're eating their regular diet. During the actual FMD week, they're eating much less. Only significant difference was in fried foods, which were consumed a bit more often by the Mediterranean diet group, twice a week average, compared to 1.4 times a week average on the FMD group. So bottom line, both diets delivered improvements. There was no clear superiority of one over the other. So the fasting mimicking diet looks pretty good in this trial, not inferior to the Mediterranean diet, which is a pretty high bar, at least by the measures that they looked at. It's also interesting that there was no trade-off. Both diets delivered weight loss and also improved lipids, including cholesterol. So there's no metabolic trade-off. It's kind of the best of all worlds. So it's two examples of the many out there that there's lots of ways to accomplish this. In terms of limitations of the fasting mimicking diet, we don't have long-term data. It's always harder with a proprietary diet. You can't find a group of people out there that are already naturally doing it that you can just follow, but maybe they'll run a longer trial in the future. For the same reason, with a proprietary diet, most of the evidence is going to be coming from the same group of people, the team that developed it, obviously, and their collaborators. And this is not a knock on the investigators. As far as I know, they do good work. But in general, in science, our confidence goes up with reproducibility as something is seen over and over and over by different teams and different institutions looking at different populations, our confidence tends to rise. So it's a really interesting paradigm. You do this for five days a month. The rest of the time you're eating a regular diet and they see these benefits. It's undoubtedly interesting. And it'll be interesting to see what else they figure out if the benefits are coming from the reduced calories or the ketones or something else about these foods. I don't think we know exactly, but it'll be interesting to see uh, what else they come up with. Also, whether a fasting mimicking diet can be replicated by somebody in their own home, just eating low calorie, high fat foods without it being this specific commercial product. Maybe an FMD type diet can be yet another option in our arsenal. For more on intermittent fasting, check out this really cool video that I made before. And here's a lot more on the Mediterranean diet and all the science behind that. I'll see you over there. Take care.